Thanks very much, Frank. And I'll answer any question, including questions from elected representatives. <laughs> I'll speak up for DCC later on, but I'll let the questions go, uh, get going first. I mean, what you've described, we've, we've a special experience of many different problems in Fibsborough. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Kira and everybody who is working together to try and make uh, Fibsborough a better place. It's, it's, it's activity like that that really makes a community come together, and I congratulate him for that, and for inviting Frank to speak with you. Um, in your very stimulating presentation, a number of issues arose, and I'm just going to reflect on three of them which kind of intertwine with each other. One is just a disruption that's happening in general. We no longer need bricks and mortar shops for lots of things, whether it be financial services or video stores or bookstores and so on and so forth. Another is kind of ideological, the consequences of ideologies, post-war ideologies that we had to deal with around, as you discussed, the promotion of the car as a mode of transport and the consequences for the way cities develop, and as well the history of, of the new Irish state, which... Um, was very eager to be modern and to appear modern with lots of new capital projects. And then I think there's a more fundamental issue as well, which I wonder you might speak to, which is, in a way, the Irish contempt for city living. We're not an urban people. We've only become urbanised in the last 40 years. So in a way, Fibsborough has not successfully moved from village to being part of the fabric of a city. And we know from people who talk about planning, is that <coughs> in Dublin in particular, that a lot of those who make decisions about the city don't live in the city. There's lots of space in between the canals, but everybody wants to race out of the city along the streets we try to cross at our peril to go and live in Lucan or Leek Slip or somewhere else in that 100 kilometre radius from Dublin. So perhaps you could speak to some of those and then I'll open up the floor for questions. Um, well, I mean, first of all, there's no contradiction between, between Fisborough being a village and being part of Dublin. You know, uh, I think that, you know, Fisborough is an urban village. It has got a distinct identity. It, it has got a focal point. It, it's got an idea, you know, you can, you can see it. I mean, it's there, it exists. You know, it, it may not be performing, you know, the way it should be. You know, it may not be as good as it could be, uh, but it is still there and it's still capable of being turned around if the will was there to do it. Um, sorry, what was the other point you were well, it, So it's about ch changes in retail. Um, yeah, the changes in retail. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert on retail. I don't know uh, what the, con the long-term consequences are going to be, except that I do know this, that Tesco, which was the biggest uh, retailer around until recently, and may even still be, but is definitely contracting, uh, that they are pigeonholing plans for large-scale out-of-town um, uh, shopping centres, uh, and even any large-scale projects, uh, because of fears that internet um, uh, retailing is going to really kind of almost change the picture so radically that there won't be a need for massive numbers of shops um, um, uh, in, uh, surrounded by acres and acres of carpet. <coughs> uh, in terms of the priorities uh, that should exist, I mean, it is simply a fact that uh, Dublin City Council uh, has, uh, has seen well, Dublin City Council's engineers, let's be more specific about it, uh, have seen places like this as really an inconvenience to the movement of traffic. Um, in fact, the engineers traditionally have seen the city as an inconvenience to the movement of traffic. Uh, and that's why they wanted to get rid of so much of it, including both sides of the Liffey Keys um, uh, from one end to the other, uh, pretty much, so that they could all be turned into the same width as uh, Woodkey is today. Um, and you can imagine the wholesale destruction that would have been wrought if that was done. They made shit of Parnell Street, of New Street, Patrick Street, Nicholas Street, High Street, uh, Corn Market, uh, and all of, those, all of those historic places. Why do tourists find it impossible to navigate uh, the area uh, of the, the Dublin the main Dublin tourist trail, which is between, essentially between the Guinness Storehouse and Trinity College. You know, Christchurch, at Christchurch, the whole thing falls apart because you're, you're, you, you are trying to negotiate your way across a traffic machine. That is what it is, a traffic machine at Christchurch Place, um, linked to further traffic machines on Bridge Street, High Street, Nicholas Street, Patrick Street, New Street, Conbrasa Street, as remade into dual carriageways. Uh, by the wretched roads, roads engineers. And uh, just as Brendan Behan used to say, and he used to complain about how there were no guards in Dublin who were from Dublin. <laughs> he used to say they were all lured down from the Kerry Mountains with lumps of raw meat. 
the engineers, the engineers, the engineers were the same. That's cer that certainly there seems to be a perceptible tension in, in, in terms of the city's council's activities between the engineers as you characterize them and the kind of the architectures, town planner, urbanists. But anyway, let's see if anybody uh, amongst our audience would like to ask Frank a question or to offer a response. Or say something. Or say something. Uh, I'm sure lots of you, you first. Um, I'm, I'm third generation. Uh, you might say who you are exactly, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry, I've got a microphone as well. So I'll leave it to people to pass it to themselves. Hi, um, my family uh, came from Limerick, West Limerick to Phipps in the early 1920s and had a small urban shop beside St. Peter's and now I've moved out to the outer suburbs that is Cabra. Um, and, uh, just a question, this Cabra actually works as an urban village. The little centre, the 26 shops, there are two um, bakers, two greengrocers, two butchers, two cafes, two of everything. So it works in a way that Phippsford just doesn't. Do you have an idea of why that is? Um, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but you're right. I mean, there, there is that long terrace of shops uh, on, on Cabra Road, on New Cabra Road, um, which, um, which, which has always been there. I mean, since the area was built, I think it goes back to the 1930s, really. Uh, and it is remark a remarkable survival. I'd I actually, now that you mention it, I I'm going to make a trip there soon <laughs> to see what the uses are like, to see what kind of shops exist there, and and maybe to reflect on 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 that issue that you've raised about why is it that that has survived and that a lot of the diversity of Fisborough has not. Um, could, I, could I just suggest something there? I, I, there's a little shop there called Treat, which is lovely, and. Uh, it's, um, and I, and what is it called? It's Treat. called Treat, and Treat. it sort of sells coffee and a little bit of food and gifts, and it's just a really nice kind of chic shop. And uh, I just happen to, you know, as I say to anybody whose business I like, why don't you think of opening a business? And the answer was traffic. The, 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 and it was so quick, it was as if they had probably considered this, and maybe are still considering but it was immediate. She just said, traffic is such a problem in Fitzroy, and I think that that is at the heart of, of from, the, from the retail point of view, that is at the heart of the issue there. I think perhaps, uh, you know, and, and again, this is, this, is an, this is a problem, if this is the case. <coughs> the fact that, it, that the shops are set back, and that there's an intervening roadway mm -hmm. that, that people can park on, may be one of the reasons why that is the case, which rather sets aside my argument that whatever is built at, on the Fisbury shopping, I still would hold to my argument, by the way, no matter what, but I think that that may be something to do. Maybe. Just check, I think NAMA own, the, and do NAMA own the Fisbury shopping yes. centre? See, the problem with something like that is, that understandably, they want to realise a short-term gain for the state to try and, you know, recoup some money, but there's no thinking of in terms of long-term sustainability of communities, so they'll just sell it to whomever, it seems. Well, I mean, uh, uh, NAMA has a, a vague kind of social remit, which is never properly defined, um, and uh, they're supposed to take into account the wider social and economic issues involving, you know, the disposal of property and so on. And I'm not sure to what extent they are taking that into account. But I think that, you know, there is such a desperate need for housing in this city. Um, and I'm not just talking about the homeless problem, I'm talking about the general need for housing. Uh, that really housing must form a major uh, element of any redevelopment of the fifth But shopping. not just housing, what kind of housing and for whom? For families? Well, I think that there should, be, there should be a mix of housing. There should, it should not be single, uh, single bedroom flats or single and two bedroom flats just. It should include uh, obviously three or four even. Didn't the City Council four. recently revise the minimum size for those, um, uh, for those units, the, the apartment units? I mean, of course. No, downwards, I thought they were actually. I can't, I, I don't know. Maybe Andrew could answer that. Yeah, no, there's been no revision down. There's been some pressure. I don't want to be. One of the local councillors, I'm chair of the planning committee, and there has been a lot of lobbying from uh, developers to produce uh, apartment size. And uh, we're doing the development plan at the moment, which sets the guidelines of what's allowed, what size apartments, how high buildings can go. We're doing that now, we've just uh, been the first round of public consultation, and the first draft of the development plan is coming out in April or May. So I think it's a really good time for people to have some input on that. 
And I would share a lot of what Frank says about his ideas about how we really have to put pedestrians first, put cyclists first, uh, before we the motor car. And that's something certainly I've tried to do for the last five years. I was chair of the transport committee, and I was the councillor who proposed the Dublin Bike Scheme. I uh, brought in the Trinity College, uh, Trinity College Bus Corridor, and that's reduced the bus journey times by about 35 minutes to get from Parnell Square uh, to Trinity College. And, uh, but we've also removed, uh, when we opened up the port tunnel, we were able to remove 95% of the HGVs from the city centre. So there are Oh, got a microphone now. Yeah, so there are some improvements, but we have a long way to go. There is a, a, a strong engineering uh, belief that the most important thing is to flush the traffic out of the city every evening, and everything we do has to be based around getting the traffic out. They're not too worried about slowing traffic coming in, but they're always obsessed with getting traffic out. And I think we have to turn it around and always promote uh, more sustainable ways of uh, running our city. So, for example, if we were to provide enough uh, road space and enough car parking space to get everybody into the city centre uh, in a quick time in the morning, there'd be no city centre left. So you have to make a nice place to attract people to come and visit before you start thinking about the car. And when you look at pedestrians or in cycling and public transport, it's a much more efficient way of getting people in and out of the city. And that's what we have to propose and that's what we have to push. So we have made some progress. We've got the Great Royal Canal routes going to be coming through uh, for cyclists this year, and, uh, but we've a long way to go. Uh, how do you account for the dysfunctionality of Dublin City Council? <laughs> I think there's, uh, there's, uh, <laughs> that's quite a sweeping statement. I think there's a lot of positive things happening in, in, in like Dublin what? City Council. <laughs> well, I, as I say, I just mentioned there, the Dublin Bike Scheme is something that I proposed. I think it's been a very big that's success for the city. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, some of the development in recent years, say for example down around uh, the Grand, uh, the Board Gosh Energy Theatre down there, I think that standard of development where the councillors... That was done by Dublin Docklands Development Authority. No, the, ca the standard of the uh, apartment size was set by the councillors when we altered the development plan, uh, introducing the minimum before we changed the plan was 35 square metres meters was the minimum size. We raised that to 55 square metres and as you mentioned there, there's pressure to reduce that again. But I have certainly no intention of voting to reduce the minimum size apartments. I think we need to just to defend the council. It's a very large organisation. Yeah. Um, it has since the lo you know local government uh, act in the 70s. It has been emasculated and deprived of power. Um, it has quite an old profile of people who are retiring and talent is being lost. And it's also it's 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 in deficit as far as I know. So anyway, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a lot of money and therefore doesn't have a lot of power. I would say in its defence. No, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> Substantiate that then. I should I to declare an interest in that I'm on one of the SBCs. Dublin City Council is in receipt of a vast volume of rates revenue, uh, commercial rates revenue, uh, which gives it a much higher level of discretionary uh, spending than most other local authorities. Yeah, we, um, we take in 325 million in rates every in year. In rates, 325 million. We spend, million, we spend which is, which 770 is, million, so yeah. we're a long way short of... Yes, but the well, rest... But, but, but a huge amount of what we spend will be, for example, on housing. We have 27,000 houses in the city. Um, we, the, the, uh, we're still responsible for um, uh, the sewerage uh, and, the, and the flood uh, and the river management. Uh, we're also responsible for the roads, uh, libraries, uh, public parks, um, air quality, yeah. um, and I'm just that we've talked a lot about that particular issue. I would like to open it up to other people who would yeah. be eager to get in. We can come back to it later on, probably. We just pass the mic up the front to this gentleman here. Forty years of Chevy. Forty years of Chevy. Okay, <laughs> much uh, um, I agree with everything Frank says. And um, the council also are planners. So I'm, sorry, I'm Peter Clark. I'm one of the RCAG, the Royal Canal Major Group, the people who badgered to get the canal. Um, the canal restored. I'm also a member of the Irish Georgian Society. Um, the, the, I blame the planners in Dublin City Council um, because we have a, a village like um, Fibsborough, a George, uh, not a Georgian village, but a Victorian village, and the facades on the front of buildings are a disgrace. And that's down to the planners. They allow plastic shop fronts, appalling signs, and the whole facade of a building destroyed. It might be very important for people to get their name in, in print across the, the front of a facade because so it can be seen on the, from the, the front of a 22 bus. And I think the planners have a lot to answer for in that. By the way, I'm, I'm from Cabra. I, this lady, um, I just happened to marry a girl from Fidra, so I have a small way to, <laughs> to say it. <laughs> and I'm also a cyclist. I have the bumps to prove. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Catherine here, my wife, we grew up in Cabra Park, 
and it is um, a disgrace the situation. Capra Park is, a, is vile at the moment. Um, it's in an appalling state. Um, I've just retired from Bolton Street and I was able to use some of the photographs um, from uh, some of the places, some of the houses in, in, in Cabra Park, what I call slum landlords, um, where there's one of them have a, a toilet um, flushing out of a toilet into a gully um, and, the, and the, the effluent coming out over the, the, the side of the, the garden. And I was able to use, I was able to get a full series of lectures um, <laughs> from my classes over the disgraceful condition of Capra Park. It's fair to say that we know that there are problems, but what would be really interesting would be if some people could share some solutions as Dorothy's project uh, posed in the first Well, for a start, go in there and stop the likes of okay. that. I mean, in fairness yeah. to the planners as well, it's about enforcement and priorities for enforcement. Yes, madam. I don't really know if this is a solution, but I was thinking, because um, really, I think that the reason why the 13 shops, 23 shops, whatever Several. it is in Canada. 17? <laughs> I think that the reason why it works is because it's only one busy street and, and Doyle's Corner obviously is an intersection of two really busy streets. But maybe what we can do is we can actually, I don't think that we're going to be able to resolve the amount of traffic that comes in in the morning, in the afternoon, but maybe what we, we can do is we can maybe have some hours where somehow we limit traffic on one of those thoroughfares and just see what happens, just it will be kind of like in the right direction. I mean, the thing is, is that you can talk about fixing that problem, but the thing is, what you're going to be doing is you're just going to be moving it because the cars aren't really going to go away anytime soon. Maybe they will. I mean, the future is about mobility solutions, not about single individuals and private cars. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to say earlier on is that Fibsler doesn't just belong to the people who happen to have a house here. It belongs to other people who use it to get through. They do have a stake in it. It's not like they they have no entitlement at all. They're also taxpayers and ratepayers. You, you're touching like you don't agree. I, I, don't know, I don't know what stake somebody from Navan who's driving through Fibsler to get to wherever has in Fibsler. I don't think he has any. They want to get to Bosaurus. <laughs> Roddy. I take that to I'm kind of repeating some stuff, but just to sort of clarify some things. First off, most people in Fibsborough don't own a car, right? Most households in Fibsborough, the majority, don't own a car. I can't drive. There you go. So I, I can give you the exact figure. 51.6% of Fibsborough households have no car, right? So it's not us. Not, not, not all of them. So, secondly, there, aren't, there isn't a Fibsborough, I don't think. I think the thing describing it as an urban village is, is kind of a problem at the moment, because there's really four Fibsboroughs, and they're... The kind of the quadrants that you see, if you look at the bottom of the map, at the, the meeting of North Circular Road and Fibsborough, I'll just go over. Um, there's Fibsborough 1, Fibsborough 2, Fibsborough 3, and Fibsborough 4. <laughs> if you want to cross the road from here to here, it's 20 metres, right? If you follow the, uh, the, the traffic lights, as you tell your kids to do, if you want them to go wandering out, it would take them six minutes. Uh, to get from to go to go 20 meters. So imagine like a round trip <laughs> of 40 meters. That'll be so a full 12 minutes. So that's a screamingly obvious problem. I mean, the the the, the problem is so clearly defined that in some respects the solution is incredibly obvious. I know it's a really difficult solution, and it does kind of mean giving the finger to traffic. But that's where we are, right? So it's not. It actually isn't a puzzle. Well, uh, I mean, all of, the, all of that is covered in the design manual for urban roads and streets. And what I would urge Andrew Montague and others on the City Council to do is to insist that the design manual for urban roads and streets becomes the policy of Dublin City Council, such that engineers will no longer be putting in sheet pen railings and all these other restraints on pedestrians and would instead try and think about it in terms of people rather than vehicles. And, it, you know, that is a fundamental thing. This manual has been out now for the last 18 months or more, maybe even more. And, you know, it has had zilch, as the Americans would say, zilch effect on the thinking of the Neanderthals in Dublin City Council. Sorry, see your hand there, Joe. Back to you want to get in first, yeah? That's it. Uh, it's, um, Declan, Nina. Um, part of the Cabra invasion. Um, 
and former candidate for the Labour Party, just so we all know her. And just to say, while I'm sitting here, I have a craving for a packet of crisps. And as I'm thinking of how I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to hit all four of the traffic lights to go from here to Spar to get a pack of crisps and then go to get my bus home. And just, you know, just as I said, like, I don't have a car. Um, slightly less choice than necessity, but i really dependent on the, the bus and on public transport. And crossing those lights as someone with a visual impairment is terrifying. Like, the, I, I was walking across today with my stick, and now I didn't quite enjoy this, but someone was legally parked, like had literally parked in my way, edging out into the next lane, and just I had to whack the car really hard with the stick so I could get around it properly. <laughs> now, I don't know, you could debate how hard, but like, Car, three cars, and you can hear them very well, three cars drove in front of me. And I know they said like 30 cars an hour break the lights, but the idea of stopping all four lanes, it would just be so much better and yes. so much safer. Like when you're crossing over and you hear cars beside you, there's this, I, I, I stopped halfway through crossing because I was afraid are, there, are some of these going to turn? It is actually really scary when you're hearing them. So, sorry, that's a bit rambling, but uh, then just, just well done. Just that. I mean, that... That that is a, I think that that should become one of your main demands is for a for a stop the traffic at Doyle's Corner. <laughs> Sorry, I see hands around the place, and so we'll try and get around to you there. You yeah. sort of first. One one comment, a slight correction. Um, Frank very kindly uh, gave Fibsburg the honour and glory of being James Gandon's. Uh, final resting place. I'm afraid our sister village in Drumcandra has that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, who is it who's buried in Philsborough then? I know there was somebody important buried in Philsborough. Francis Johnson, brother. Oh, Francis Johnson, I beg your pardon. It is Francis Johnson, you're absolutely right. Francis Johnson, who designed the GPO in O'Connell Street, among many others. And, and the Chapel Royal in Dublin Castle. And, and St. George's Church. <laughs> Just, um, sorry, Declan's point there just about the, the traffic lights, which I completely agree, they are, they are dangerous uh, to, to people with visual impairments. I mean, there, are, there is a, um, I can't remember, a staggered crossing, so it's a crossing in two phases, and on one half of it, the signal goes, you know, it's an audible signal, and actually I don't know how it will be very clear which half is the signal, so it is, it is very dangerous. And I also went out with my camera one day and I took a few photographs, and when the light goes green for the pedestrian, you know, up to three and four cars coming from Fibsborough Road, turning right onto Connacht Street, say, will overshoot that traffic light. So it's very dangerous for kids, oh, for anybody, it's just plain dangerous. But these were the very points that we brought to our meeting with the Minister and with the councillors and the Guardi. Which Minister? <laughs> Uh, Pascal Donoghue and is he, is he still here? I don't know. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're taking it all in. <laughs> Sorry, do you want to respond, Pascal? Well, if I could say a few words, maybe. Do you want to get Pascal? Do you mind if I just said something first? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, just from the point of view of parenting, I've I have walked that road probably more than anybody I don't know here. I have four kids. They go to school in Glass Nevin. We have no car. And I walked up and down the Road for 15 years with each of them. And it is a terrifying experience for children. Um, I can't understand why, if the road narrows at the bridge, why on earth does it widen then between the bridge and Fitzroy Shopping Centre where it narrows again? I, I don't understand it. When we moved to Fitzroy 15 years ago, 16 years ago, there was engineers out on the road cutting the footpath in half in terms of width to make that bit wider. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So I think what they should do is um, narrow that road between the bridge and Fiddler Shopping Centre, plant trees along the centre of it, double the width of the footpaths, and just have one lane up and one lane down. Because... Well, I, I don't know, I'm not a planning expert, but I've heard it said that if you don't make room for cars, they just find somewhere else to go, and people find some other way of getting into the city. So I just, you know, it's, it's disgraceful. And it also, it doesn't encourage families to walk. Um, you know, children should be walking up and down to school on their own. It's good for them, it's sociable. You know, it's just, it's crazy. There's, there was a book written about 20 years ago, which was actually quite influential in, in ways, uh, which was called Jam Yesterday, Jam Today, and Jam Tomorrow. 
And its essential thesis was that the more road space you create for cars, the more it will fill up with cars. And that you, the only way to, to, to deal with the situation is by restricting the amount of space. We should make all the engineers read Jane Jacobs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've, they've never heard of Jane Jacobs. Yeah. <laughs> Who wrote a famous book in 1961 called The Life and Death of the Great American City, which is all about how the motor car ruled the American post-war. Minister Pascal Dunn, who you wanted to remark. Thank you. Well, just to um, offer a few thoughts in relation to the meeting so far. Uh, uh, I have been Minister for Transport now for seven months, uh, and I've lived in Phippsburg for 11 years. Uh, so I have a very strong interest in all of the points that have been made, both as resident as a minister. And uh, I listen with great interest to your presentation, Frank. Um, I have one of your books, uh, which is somewhat relevant to the discussion we're talking about here this evening, Chaos at the Crossroads, which you wrote with James Nix a number of years ago. I have it in my office. Uh, because at that time, that book did describe where we come from, but describe the dark future that we could go to. Unfortunately, most of which has been realised. And to sketch out a bit more regarding what that future could look like, just from a transport point of view, just to talk a big picture, before I just bring it back to specific action steps for Fibsborough and where they stand. If current traffic forecasts, if, no, if traffic trends over the last 12 months, and if economic growth over the last 12 months was to continue up to 2023, by that point in 2023, there'll be an additional 40,000 cars coming into Dublin, which of itself would necessitate building around 35 high-rise car parking blocks in our city centre. And most of those journeys would be originating on the north side of the city because the development, the likely development potential will be on the northern fringe of our city and most of that traffic, if current transport patterns were not to change, would either come through our own uh, neighbourhood um, or would come through the Swords and the Drumcondra area. So that is the challenge that we are facing in the future, on top of what has just been described by Frank and by other people. In terms of what can be done to deal with that and to respond back to the challenge that we have, I was a member of the City Council back in 2004, that led to a development plan, that led to a Fibsborough local area plan, the vast majority of which has not been implemented. I think there's very four specific points that we have to respond to, some of which I have direct responsibility for. The first thing I have direct responsibility for is getting Lewis Cross City built, funded, and bringing it out to Cabra and Fibsborough. Um, you can see the preparatory works for that are already underway on the old rail line that has been removed. But going back to the future, the Lewis track for that will be going in across the next uh, number of months. And there will be between two and three Lewis stops, either in Phippsburg or the immediate vicinity of Phippsburg. And I will be signing the contract to make all that irrevocable, I hope, before summer. And that is a key building block to how we respond back to everything we've described here in terms of economic revitalisation and in terms of responding to the transport challenge that is there. Because what that will do is link up our part of the city with the broader Lewis network and crucially link it up with the hard rail network in Broombridge. And that is of extraordinary importance to responding back to that. And I hope to get the contract for that done so that that will happen in 2017. The second point is Dublin Bikes. It's already been touched on by Andrew Montague. Dublin Bikes touches the cusp of Phippsborough, but doesn't actually come into Phippsborough itself. And something that we have to make progress on, that's part of my responsibility, is how Dublin Bike can actually come into residential, more residential areas within Dublin 7. Uh, because the way it is at the moment, it's within touching distance, but you can't actually use it if you're a resident in the area, excuse me, you can't readily use it if you are a resident in the area because the nearest stop is in, uh, outside the Matra Hospital to us. The third point is Daily Mount. Daily Mount has not been purchased by Dublin City Council as of Wednesday evening. There was a newspaper article that had a headline that indicated the opposite 
but had a statement from Dublin City Council that it said it had not yet been purchased. But a lot of discussion and negotiation is going underway in relation to that, that involves many different parties at the moment. It's only half the story. If that negotiation is successful, what is more important is what will happen in that site in the future. That's the big challenge. And I clearly have a strong interest in that as Minister for Sport, but there will be a, bro there will be a big discussion, I hope to be had, regarding what will happen to that site. But it, it, is, it is by no means certain what will happen there yet, and it's a matter for Dublin City Council, the FAI, and a large number of banks, and Bohemian Football Club, and Shelburne Football Club. But that, I, I think it's important to be accurate for fear of misleading people in any way regarding where that stands. So I'm not accusing anybody of doing that. But I hope that we will be able to have a positive future for that site, because at the moment it's virtually, despite the best efforts of Bohemian Football Club, it's virtually the l large portions that are, not to use too fine a word, I'm afraid they're derelict. It's an awful pity, given where that site has come from. And then the final point then will be the Fibsburg Local Area Plan. Uh, the last plan failed for two reasons. Public service invest, public sector investment, which was going to be a catalyst for it all, fell off a cliff. With the exception of Grange Gorman, nothing else happened. And private sector investment, for reasons everybody knows about, stopped. That could change in the coming 12 to 18 months. Do you want evidence of that? Cabra Hills, up the road from us, from the 17 shops, a week ago, a planning application went in for 398 apartments, of which 85% are either one or two bedroom. Uh, if you look at some of the planning that has gone in, in relation to the Shandon Mill site, or the bakery site that's beside us, private sector investment, there will be more potential for that in the future. Getting the Fibsburg local area plan right is the best opportunity there is to manage both private sector and public investment. And I hope and believe that will be going out for further public consultation next month. And while Frank is right to say that the use of buildings is what matters, rather than the design, if we don't get the design right, the use won't fly. Well, I won't didn't say rather than the design. Oh, excuse me. It was against facades. Both. Both. Well, but I was going so well and like. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I should have stopped. I should have stopped at the third point. <laughs> um, but no. But if the local area plan will go out for consultation. I hope next month. But the other three points in relation to transport are of huge importance. And there'll be one final decision that will be made, which will deal with the broader challenge that we have here. The feature of how we've done transport planning in our country is we build the roads, but we don't deliver the public transport projects. Metro North didn't happen. Metro West didn't happen. The expansion of the Lewis is only happening now. Um, and I will have to make a decision before the summer regarding a new public transport plan for the north side of the city, which will have an effect on our community here. And that would be a big element in how we make sure that the traffic chaos that could face us in the future that we have a plan for to deal with now. So, I hope, I'm, I'm sorry for misinterpreting you, Frank, it was done so unintentionally, but I just wanted to put some points out that are specific that decisions will be made on in the next three to six months. And I hope and believe this forum can play a role in relation to Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think just uh, just like uh, any other part of Ireland, uh, Finsbury is fortunate in having a minister in the government. And, uh, and I, I hope uh, Pascal delivers the goods. Sorry about the thing about Daily Man Park. Uh, I thought it was a done deal, but that was only because I read, I believe what I read in the papers. <laughs> so, uh, but in relation to the wider issue of uh, transport uh, policy, um, I think that the Department of Transport itself produced an excellent policy document uh, some years ago, uh, which was called Smarter Travel, which was designed specifically to deal with the exponential growth in car commuting, uh, and, and pledged, indeed, as a matter of policy, uh, to turn this whole situation around be between then and 2020. Uh, and there is absolutely no evidence that the Department of Transport and particularly its Secretary General, Tom Manley, 
uh, has any commitment to uh, this policy whatsoever. Um, and finally, in relation to the availability of funding, it is really important to point out, the Minister mentioned that, you know, unfortunately we spend an awful lot of money on roads and very little on public transport, and we put a lot of money into roads and then the public transport doesn't get done. We are now spending 550 million euro on a motorway between Gort and Toon in County Galway, which will reach its design capacity, sorry, will reach a quarter of its design capacity in 2030. In other words, the motorway is not necessary. We could have built a much better road between Gort and Toon for much less than half that price. But the NRA has been out of control for a long number of years. And it's just getting... Thank you. Well, very quick, Pastor. I feel like I'm after because Frank... Um, just, just make the point quickly. You, know, you, you just named somebody who isn't here to yeah. give a view back. It's a fair comment. Is, but it may be a fair comment, but Tom O'Mahony is the Secretary General of my department. And I do believe that people should have the right of reply, but he's not here to do so. He's a public I, figure. He is indeed. But I just want to say, as Minister of the Department, Tom isn't here. Take it up smarter travel with the Minister. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Ask him about well, it. Be, be that as may, would you, you, would you like to say something in his defence or just to note that he's there? That as a minister, well, as a minister whose responsibility for the area, even though Tom isn't here, that my commitment to delivering public transport is evidenced by the delivery of Lewis Cross City and making sure that works. I just want to say that. In the ask sense about, of ask Tom Manley about it on Monday. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we might just ask who's interested in service for people in cars and not in public transport and what, who they have the ear of. A uh, uh, gentleman with a scarf down there. Yourself, yeah, it's not a scarf, but it looks like a scarf from here. No scarf. <laughs> uh, my name is Shane Coleman. I've lived in Shandon for the last uh, 20 years nearly. Uh, what I'd love to see from tonight is some realistic suggestions and realistic objections or objectives that we could take from this meeting. Like, I don't think we're going to change Dublin City Council's mind on you know the, 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 the bus corridors coming through Fibsborough. That's not going to change. We have to accept that we are an archery. I don't like the fact, I'd love if it was different, but that's not going to change. I wonder, is it more realistic to look at traffic calming measures rather than trying to reduce the number of lanes? I, I have a particular passion about the bridge at Cross Gun key, Crossgun Keys, which is an absolute death trap. And uh, Orlo is absolutely right, the, the footpath there, I mean, even when you're on the footpath, you're in fear of being knocked down. Now, I know uh, somebody mentioned, I, I think uh, it was yourself, Councillor, who mentioned the fact that you have that walk or that cycleway coming along the canal. I mean, I wonder, is that an opportunity for us to redesign that bridge, to try and have some kind of safe way for pedestrians and cyclists to traverse that bridge? But I'd love to see those two objectives, one, cross guns, keys, and two, a way, as happened, for example, in, in Drunkhandra, of actually slowing down the traffic coming into Fibsborough. Now all the hands are flying up. Joe Costello, we take a few at a time. Joe Costello, TDXE down there. You had your hand up earlier on as well, sorry to get to you. And I see Des there, and I see you, and there's another hand, Dorothy, and there's another one there. Okay, maybe we take a bunch of, but try and keep it concise, please. Just a couple of points. First of all, to, to congratulate Frank. He's always challenging, to say the least. And FizzFest, which really has put Fibsborough on the map over the last number of years. Uh, and, you know, just to, to talk about things that are going on, for example, tomorrow morning, uh, FizzFest is organising a cleanup of Fibsborough. And. Um, 10 o'clock, meet at the library. Yeah, and the fact, <laughs> exactly, at the library at 10 o'clock. Uh, and the fact that FizzFest has entered Fibsborough for the tidy towns is really a feather in their cap and it's something that very practical and something that can be worked on. And one of the major nightmares around the area has been dumping and litter, uh, which really has to be addressed as well and the local authority is, plays a major role in there and it's probably a bigger role in that respect. But the community is coming together and uh, very much in dealing with that area. It was an issue that I just wanted to tease out is the local area plan 
And I would have been very much involved in promoting the local area plan as well as the, the Dublin, the, the city development plans. But I was just thinking that it's almost a blessing in disguise that Dublin City Council and the other uh, people who are responsible for implementing the plan never did anything about it. Because if we look at some of the issues that were raised and that Frank mentioned, look at Daily Mount, which I think is, is well advanced even though it hasn't been signed up at the present time. It had been sold for 60 million, it was going to be closed down, it was going to be built on office blocks, a bit of residential. So the entire area was going to be lost in terms of plane pitches and what might come about downstream, what's been talked about at the present time. If we look at Mount Joy Prison, Mount Joy Prison was going to be bulldozed according to the then Minister for Justice, Michael McDowell, uh, and all of that was going to be got rid of, and there was going to be a shopping centre built on that. That was what they were talking about. We see what was going to happen in the Matter Hospital, 16 storeys. Indeed, that's probably one, the one good thing that came from the local area plan was that the maximum height was nine storeys, and therefore the 16 storeys that wasn't even able to take a helicopter uh, meant that Dublin City Council, giving permission to it, were breaking their own statutory plan. But we didn't have the Lewis, we had no public transport at that particular time, six years ago. Neither did we have uh, the Grange Common Development. So in six years time, sorry, in six years from the time of the local area plan, if it had been implemented as intended, it would have contributed very substantially to the destruction of Fibsborough. And the areas that needed to be addressed were areas in the public realm. Street furniture, signs, traffic, the junction that's causing so much trouble, transport, none of that has been, has been addressed and that's what we're talking about. But whether or not you put in place a statutory plan that then becomes the template when there is so much change, the Celtic Tiger that was in place envisaged a very different type of development public-private partnerships, the private sector was going going ho at the time. So unless there is a community stroke public control over a plan of this nature, it could in fact cause more damage than good. So that's just a question I'm throwing out there because we have the only full-blown uh, local area plan in the city of Dublin. And we are now reviewing it after six years and we're going to either put it in place, improve it, or I don't doubt it's going to be rejected per se. But there's a huge, huge number of elements in it that are very questionable. So we have to look into that as well as the transport side. But I would agree with what Pascal has said in relation to the transport. Until we get a strong element of public transport in the area, including the Lewis, and I'm not sure what's happened to the Metro, the Metro's in, in mothballs at the present time, having built an underground station in the Matter Hospital, and until we get a residential bike scheme, as Andrew has mentioned, and until we do, as Frank has said, put the pedestrians and put the people first, I can't see us being able to manage what is the biggest intersection in the city. Sorry, Thank you. can I ask those not running for election next year to keep their comments? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, what would be great for me as well as would be if the people um, cycling Dublin bikes didn't cycle along the pavement when I'm walking to school in the morning with the children. Uh, and if the city council, if, 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 if the city council would be charged for parking on Berkeley Road when I'm trying to cycle myself on a Dublin bike or on my own bike, that's that's just my view. Cycles have no reference. Yeah, there's no bike lanes. They're red things in the road, but they're not bike lanes. Can we ask people to be more concise? Bring it if you might want to put Just quick. Uh, point um, brief enough. Um, I did probably the opposite of most people. I'm, fr I'm from Lucan originally. I've been living in Fibs for about eight and a half years now. Um, <laughs> so I I've seen the, the, it's it different, but the planning first time I went off in Lucan was horrendous. Um, in the 1990s, the, um, it was the fastest growing town in Europe. Um, it's just, you know, so what went on in Lucan was, was absolutely horrendous. But I moved from Lucan into Fibs about eight and a half years ago. I suppose the big question I do, I'm hearing a lot of comment from people is, you know, and come back to what this the example of data amount. All I hear is um, Dublin City Council talking to, to banks, talking to football clubs. It's it's a, it's not a case. Of, so it's a case of what we as individuals and everyone here seems pissed off. So it's a case of what we as as 
residents in Fibtil, what are we going to take away from here tonight? And I think that's, that's what I want to kind of get out, that's why I came here tonight, is it's, you know, we're all angry, we're all annoyed, um, etc., as individuals, and it, it's absolutely fantastic the work that the FizzFest has done. But I think that's the way we all, and I put myself front and centre that as well, is what are we as residents, because at the end of the day, if you believe we live in a democracy, we have like public officials here, we have politicians, etc., they will listen to us, and they will have to listen to us. And so, I would say, that's what I would take away from people tonight, what we as a group yeah, are going I think it's productive because it identifies a problem, but it's not an end in itself. You know, so the, problem, the issue is for us not to get mad, but to get even. And then to look, at, to look at the instruments that there are for achieving change, I think a lot has been spoken about the development plan tonight, and then there are other instruments as well. It's necessary that we ventilate, but that's, I think we should spend the next, and the last part of the meeting, maybe the last 15 minutes, proposing solutions only. Willie, can I say one thing? Yes, yes. Well, well, no, you can't actually, because no, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like. sorry. Um, I just want to short though, please, sir. Yeah, I, I want to address Shane's point uh, specifically, got to do with the footpath across Guns Bridge. And at the meeting uh, in the end of January that myself and other members of the Fib uh, Reimagining Fibsborough campaign had in Minister Pascal O'Donoghue's office with members of Dublin City Council, we've made a specific proposal with regard to that, that a parallel pedestrian cycling bridge be created across, um, across the canal. And we've also, there's lots of precedents for this, and we showed an image of a one in Chapel Lizard that was built relatively recently. This really has to be done. Um, it's, it's a, like, in the Put Yourself in the Picture book, there's people saying they don't feel safe on that stretch of road. Um, and I, one more point is that we need a local area plan, but we don't need it in order to implement the suggestions in the design manual for <coughs> urban roads and streets. Yeah. They just yeah. need to be done. Mm -hmm. You're passing my phone just down, down, down there. Uh, Turn taking. Yes, uh, hi, I'm not um, from Fibsboro, I'm from Stony Ladder. But I've been very interested in Fibsboro because I've had, um, since I attended the Grange Gorman uh, public consultations, I've I, had, I wrote a, what was sort of a fallacy um, concept for a green corridor, which would have at that time, I thought, go down the old derelict railway corridor, or cutting, to the new campus, and it would be a green, a green corridor for this area of the city, a piece of green infrastructure. And that, that concept has changed over time. Um, now the Lewis is going to go down there, but it never was intended to be a fixed concept. It was intended to be a vision for this area of the city. So I've continued to adapt that vision. And I've been, um, now that the Lewis is going down there, one thing that has happened is DIT have actually purchased a, a, a piece of ground, the old Hanron, is it? Um, recycling factory up there on in the Bridge. Bridge. No, no. Hanning. Uh, Hanning. 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 I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, it's, it's in Broombridge. It's right next to the Broombridge station and for a sports complex, which actually gives them a destination. So the idea of my green cycling, walking, um, multi um, intermodal transport link to the new campus that would accommodate cycling and walking and running and uh, makes sense because they have to get people who are doing sports back to the campus and they could run and warm up, and et cetera, on the way. So um, I've been looking at, since the, the cutting is um, occupied, there's the old canal which you mentioned, the old canal used to come down, used to go under what is the Phipps Road. Over. Over, okay. But I, I guess my vision is that you could go under and then you could go over the canal and you could connect with um, the path, the new cycle path on the north side. And that you could create a wonderful land bridge that would go, which would go the same way the aqueduct did over the Phipsworth Road into the new campus. I don't know if you've ever seen land bridges, but they're just stunning sort of extensions of parks that go over roads. And um, I'm still, you know, I'm working away on this. And this year, okay, I'm sorry, I'm taking too long. But anyway, um, I have a website, desireland.ie, and I have a lot of information there. But this year I'm starting with bees, and I'm hoping that bees a bee project can lead us to thinking differently about the city, and I will be walking up that path and placing bait hives and things on it. It's so that, the yeah. they need to perfectly behind. Sorry, just, we're not going to get to all the questions. So, for those of you who do get the mic, could you keep it short, please, so more people can participate? We're going to end in like 10 minutes. Yes, here. Yes, yes, you're, you're going to come up and wrap up. different here.
So three, ten minutes, so use three, it well and be generous. Three simple actions, and they're all about slowing down Fibsborough, slowing down traffic, slowing down people. Because when you slow down space, um, interesting things happen, and you know it's, it's not pleasant to drive through anymore, and you want to actually stop instead of drive through. So the first is um, a well-proven technique of ramps. Uh, put ramps all sides of Doyle's Corner. It's a proven um, dead spot, traffic spot issue, and I think that will win, you know, because it's a safety issue, and the engineers will respond to that one. Um, lobby for um, an extra bike station for Dublin Bikes, because that will bring people to the area. It helps to grow business, connecting with the canal and so on, and more bikes in the area will also slow down cars. And thirdly, which is a little bit more guerrilla, um, but maybe mark, pay, make it part of the FizzFest, but there's nothing illegal about actually occupying parking spaces and actually coming out with your IKEA chairs and tables and having coffee and cake and, and make it a spectacle for the cars passing through and they will slow down. Um, sorry, your hand up there. Yeah, sorry, just very quickly. Uh, like quick, that was great. Thanks very much. Uh, very quickly, uh, this was an idea that actually came up during the Fizz Festival, and I thought it was amazing. Uh, I'm going to put my business hat on. I'm a, a founder and owner of two businesses, and during the course of both of them, they needed to be renewed, and we did a, a corporate identity. We changed the name, identity, and that actually made everything possible. So when Frank was talking there, it uh, got me thinking that we actually do have a bike shop in Fizzburg, Butter. We actually do have a number of fruit and veg. We, we actually do have all those th 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 two so hardware so shops. So, so I think one of the problems when you look at this is that no one really knows what Fibsburg is because of all this traffic. Mm -hmm. And I remember the thing that came out for me at the Fizzfest was this idea of, I think they renamed it the borough, but it doesn't matter the name. It's, when you do it for a business, what it allows you to do is look at all your obstacles with a new light and everything seems possible. Your staff suddenly go, oh, well, that could be done. So I just think, have you ever seen that done anywhere where uh, an area of a city, an area uh, has ever been rebranded and renamed in a... a, a Temple Bar. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or fortunately, you're going to the village So thank you. This is passing on to Des there, who's got him. Sorry, just, just on the theme, I'm indebted to Deputy Moyen O'Sullivan, who recently brought to my attention from correspondence she had with the National Road Authority, that the two roads that meet at Doyle's Corner used to be the N2 and the N3, two national primary routes meeting at the Victorian crossroads, but they don't meet there anymore. They stopped meeting there on the 3rd of February 2012 when the National Road Authority renamed them. <laughs> That's all they did. They just renamed the roads, now they don't meet. Extraordinary. But before, uh, well, I have the mic. I, I uh, was at the Dublin Crisis Conference with Frank uh, uh, 29 years ago last month. And that conference came about significantly through Frank's journalism at the time and through the work of Victor Griffin and uh, campaigners like the late Rico Ross, the late Deirdre Kelly. Uh, it was a seminal weekend in my life. Uh, I was very inspired by uh, the contribution that Frank made. And that, that was 1985, when Manny was living in Dublin, knew that planning in the city was palpably corrupt. He just knew by being in the city that planning in the city was corrupt. And through the work of the man we have here with us this evening, I know I want to talk about Fisborough, I want to talk about Frank for a minute. Through Frank's journalism and others around him, over a sustained period of 10 years, submitting to legal challenges and threats and all that sort of stress, uh, we hope, I hope, planning in Dublin City is a little bit less corrupt. So I just wanted to say something about Frank as well as about Fisborough. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I just wanted everybody to know that um, a full copy of our presentation that we made to the Minister on Dublin City Council is on our website and you can go in and an awful lot of the recommendations that were made here tonight are, have all been listed and number one on the list was the emergency funding for that parallel um, bridge at Crossgoods. But all of the other suggestions about um, the um, stopping the lights at, for, for pedestrians to cross the Doyle's Corner, they're all in there and we have a follow-up meeting um, when the, in April, when um, Dublin City Council will have had a chance to consider the recommendations, and we'd be reporting back. Thanks very much. Oh, no, that's the mic one other gentleman with the beard. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I just want to say the local area plan has come in for a bit of stick, uh, so I just want to say a word in its defence. Um, <coughs> and that word being that, uh, first of all, I'm not sure the prison 
for the most prisons of the, the age of Mount Joy uh, in the British Isles are insanitary, overcrowded, and don't meet ordinary human rights, uh, basic human rights standards. Uh, I'm not sure what this, I happily don't know what the state of Mount Joy is, but I'd be suspicious that uh, that prison is staying where it is for reasons of cost rather than for reasons that it's functional uh, or fit for any proper That's purpose. That's precisely the argument I made. Right. <coughs> um, so, the, 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 I think Joe's point about the prison is, is not necessarily well made. The other point about it is that the local area plan, uh, for all its defects, at least created a balance between development that was surging ahead and community facilities, community needs, community gain. And what has happened subsequently was that the City Council attempted to throw that plan into the bin to entirely write off the community gain aspects of it. And I think the, the campaign to get a new plan has basically been about protecting the area against things like <clears throat> massive houses going up beside two storied uh, terraces, something that the people uh, next to the Smurfit site uh, have been faced with in the very near past, and also about getting basic community facilities, places where pl something big enough to hold a meeting like this. Uh, we don't have it. The old St. Peter's Hall <coughs> was the best we had, and it wasn't very good, and it's gone. So I think the community gain. I'm say we're going to be able to take one more. Pass the ladies have a hand up here with curly hair and you can. Very quickly, um, Marion just mentioned that this chap wants to go home with some real suggestions. Uh, it's in um, Dorothy's um, uh, proposals, um, and Frank mentioned it as well. And then I got a big hand of applause, and it just seems to me very simply done. Can we not at least experiment with? stopping the traffic lights in both directions, just for a short period of time. It would require now changing the traffic lights a little further on, but you'd stagger that, so you're talking maybe only a kilometre out in either direction. You could just bloody experiment with it, with very little cost. I mean, we do what this lady suggests, we have our tea every ten minutes. Come in and out and have our tea in the middle, but very cheap, and we could go on with, with that. Why do we also do what? But if we take the traffic is there, there's two hours a day coming in, two hours a day going out, why don't we change priority for the other 20 hours? Good, uh, good idea. Why do we also no need, why do we need a pedestrian crossing at the library when we have them at the, at the crossroads? Good question. Because I walk that way all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this part of the conversation is for Clark shortly. Can I, can I thank you all for your attention and for your questions to say sorry that we didn't get around to everyone. Is there anything you'd like to say by way of conclusion? Thank you. Well, all I, all I would say is, is this, the only way uh, the, only, the only way to defeat a bureaucracy bent on its own agenda is by having your own agenda and forcing the bureaucracy to adopt it rather than their own. And that is a, can seem like a, a, labyrinth, or, I mean, a Sisyphus like struggle, pushing a stone up a mountain and all the rest of it, but it's still worth doing because, you know, like all of Des mentioned the Dublin Crisis Conference that was held in February of 1985 in the Senate Hall in Christchurch Place. And all of the demands that we made at that time, at a time when Dublin was on its knees, was absolutely in bits. And there was 150 acres of derelict land in the centre of the city. All of the demands that we made, which began with the central demand, which was calling on the government and the Dublin local authorities to recognise and accept that the city is in crisis, and then to take the following measures. Every single one of those measures, except for one, has become part of official policy. And at the time, they were regarded as heretical. We were heretics. They had all the answers. We were heretics. Um, and we were proven right. So I'm saying, get out there and fight for yourselves. And for critical. Thank you very much, Kira. Do you want to speak to tenacity just, and heresy? Um, just very, very briefly, absolutely, here, here, Frank, we must be heretical about this. I mean, it's fantastic to have this meeting. It shows the energy and the drive that there is in the community. And, of course, it's about to be over now, and we'll all go home feeling this sense of empowerment and then asking, 
where, what are we going to do now? So the only thing I want to say as we finish up is that uh, the FizzFest Facebook page and website is there. We're all easy to contact in that way. And anybody who would like to become involved in this campaign, we would be absolutely delighted to have you on board. The only way that we are going to get any change, as has been said, and as everybody recognises, is if we make noise. We absolutely have to make noise. This aspect of the uh, Doyle's crossing, um, what everybody would like to see there, I can promise you that that is the biggest single obstacle that we face. The special problem of traffic is actually what's at the top of the hierarchy. It should be at the bottom. It's at the top. It is going to take us making a lot of noise. So please take the energy that you feel tonight and come on board this campaign and talk to your local representatives and politicians who are going to be very nice to you over the next while. <laughs> talk to them on the doorstep, be ready to say you want to reimagine Pittsburgh. Thank you all very much.